Tonight. Welcome everybody to this week's episode of Girl Talk. My very special guest this week is Mr. Adam Pickfins. Adam is the president of the Also Foundation. Adam, welcome to Girl Talk. Hi, Kay, and thank you for inviting me. Well, my pleasure. You are president. I am. Recently appointed. Very recently. I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when did you when did you actually take up your post? Uh, it was in September. The way Also works is that we have a membership so that once a year we have to um, conduct an annual general meeting. So that occurred and um, uh, the board is elected, there can be 12 positions on the board and uh, the preference is that they're made up of a variety of people including a variety of gender, so we have male, female. We're also very fortunate this year that we have a transgendered person on our board, oh, which is good. So, and we've also got interest from a very young person who would like to be on the board. So the mix is happening, which is a good thing. Yeah, that young person thing is interesting because, mm. <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the history of also is, it was actually a, was it, was it formulated as, as an organisation to cater to kind of retiring needs of yeah, uh, no more mature yeah. lesbians and gays, is that right? Yeah, it's definitely right. Yeah. Um, that was one of the factors for the, for the starting of also, um, and certainly an important one. A second one was, um, in 1981 legislation was passed that uh, made homosexual acts not illegal anymore. So uh, that happened in March of 1981, I that believe. Recent. Yes. And uh, as part of that, they held a celebration or a gay day was held in 1981. And so from that also began, and, and the other influence was to cater for older people okay. and to try and set up a retirement home. Yeah, because these are, these are very important issues. What does also actually stand for? I'm sure our viewers at this point of time wondering what we're talking about. <laughs> Well, we, not, very, not very many people use the full name anymore because we may not like it, but it also actually stands for the Alternative Lifestyles Organisation. Okay. Mac Ronan is, um, is traditionally known as the founder and a very important influence still with ALSO, um, and he's member number one. Oh, right. Uh, and we're very fortunate that Mac, uh, Mac is a life member of ALSO and uh, from time to time shares some of the background and the history of where the organisation has come from, I believe, is very important um, when you look at your future directions. Okay. So how many, how big is it? How many members are there in ALSO? There's roughly a thousand members of ALSO. Um, and a really good thing about our membership base is that they are involved. Uh, we've, something I'll talk a little bit later on with you about is uh, the future directions, obviously, but in part of, as part of looking at our future directions, we serve out our membership. We sent them out a survey and said, what do you think we should do? What's important to you? And we've received a huge response, right. um, way more than we would expect. Uh, normally when you send out membership surveys, you might get 10, 50 back, but out of 1,000, we're looking at getting at least a couple of hundred surveys back. So that means at least 200 people have sat down, taken the time to express their thoughts on paper, and sent them back to us. And that's, that's a fantastic feedback from our membership base. Yeah, because that's, that's quite exciting, because that almost like is reflective of the ownership that the members feel yeah. of also. We probably should, I also have been responsible for uh, some, some of the big dance parties, is mm -hmm. that right? Yes. And that, that's probably where some of our viewers may have seen the name. Yes. So does that form, do the dance parties still form the ma major source of revenue? Yes, um, the dance parties are a fundraiser uh, that also uses um, to raise funds for the community and so that we can also cover the activities, the administrative activities of what we do. Right, yeah. okay. And we, we run the three big ones which are well known, which is the New Year's Eve dance party, the Red Raw dance party and the Winter Days dance party. Okay. Yeah. And they are big, aren't they? Oh, they are. Yeah. yeah. And Ms. I believe Ms. Tracy Wall, who's going, hopefully going to be a guest on this program, was, was yeah. fronting up some of the dance parties. So, yes. so stay tuned for that interview. Now, with, um, I believe that the money actually goes, it, it, it's made available for grants. Is, is this a good time to start talking about sure. those? Is it, could we do that? Yeah. So, um, what kind of grants are available and how, do you, how does one access them? Okay, as I mentioned, the, the, fun, the dance parties are fundraisers and if 
if we do really well out of our fundraising activities, there's a complicated formula, which I won't go into, which uh, enables the board or the, or the also foundation to decide how much money they will have available for community grants in a financial year. This financial year, I'm very pleased to say that we've got we've allocated seventy thousand dollars, which are going into our community grant um, program. Seventy thousand. Yes. So, would I be right in saying that the dance parties are fairly successful? <laughs> they are. Yeah, they can be. Yeah. Um, but although it was only two financial years ago, I think it was that the also foundation actually lost money. So really? it can be a risky business. Too many overheads. Yeah, and perhaps we lost touch with a little bit of our, our party base of what of what our clients wanted and. Uh, with um, Tracy Wall being involved, obviously that, that certainly helped. And Virginia Barrett is our new event production manager and she's full time. So that means that she can, she's there for a full 12 months, she can take a bigger view and hopefully put on a bigger and better production, which is important for people to go. Yeah, it is important because it means there's more money. Yes. So the grant scheme, our ma we have two forms of grant schemes. One which is the major grant scheme, which uh, there's two round or two application rounds for that each financial year. and. Um, the first round is currently underway at the moment, and I think there's about $23,000 will be given out in that first um, grants round. Right. Obviously, $70,000 sounds like a lot of money, and it is from a community organisation. It's, it's quite unprecedented in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but um, there's a lot of expectations out there and a lot of demands because the gay, lesbian and allied communities quite often don't find they have successful means of gaining funding from, other, from either government sources or from other community organisations. So we're, we're trying to increase our fundraising ability so we can meet that demand more and more. With the, um, can we, can, well, who are some of the recipients of these grants? Bent TV has, mm -hmm. only small bits though. Yes. <laughs> As I said, the expectation is, there's a lot of demand out there, sure. the expectation is high. I think. One good thing that um, Barry Taylor is actually one of the board members of also, and he's the convener of the Community Development Committee, which is the committee responsible for um, making recommendations for the delivery of these grants. And um, one thing they're looking at is deciding on special targets or projects, perhaps for a year. So they might, for a year, they might look at youth issues as being important, or, or elder persons issues as being important, etc. And so. Traditionally in the past, the grants have gone to a variety of people and to a variety of organisations, sorry, not to individuals, to a variety of organisations across the state. So it doesn't just go to Melbourne organisations. Are there any individual grants <coughs> at all? Uh, not, with, not within the major uh, grants that I'm aware of, no, not within that grant scheme. We do have a minor grant scheme which is for amounts of up to $500. Oh, that's what I'm thinking yeah. of, okay. But, and that's, that can go towards helping performing artists, etc. Yeah. Well, one recently helped, I think Greg, Greg Atkins, who's a chap in a wheelchair and it actually okay. provided funds for him to go up to Sydney. Okay. Can we um, get a little bit personal? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Sort of a close, up, up front and, and personal. Where's your, you're you're um, originally involved with Team Melbourne, is yep. that right? Yes. What's Team Melbourne? Team Melbourne was formed out of the Also Foundation actually, and this is another really? thing of what Also has done. Most of the gay and lesbian... From the loins of Also. Absolutely. <laughs> So comes Team Melbourne. <laughs> yes, Team Melbourne is Melbourne's um, gay and lesbian sport and recreation body. So it's set up to try and encourage um, gays and lesbians to participate in sport and recreation activities and to have a bigger view of the world right. in relation to those activities. And that, that includes things like the International Gay Games, which were held in Amsterdam very recently. Amsterdam, right. Which um, I think there was something like 150 people from Melbourne went to those Did games. Did you go? No, no, I was stuck here. Oh, yeah. right. Pursued the presidency instead? Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't go, but um, Caroline Simons, who's the vice president, went. Okay. And she's, she knows a lot about the, the International Gay Games and the Federation of Gay Games. And she said it was fantastic. Yeah. And what are some of the, um, it, the, specifically, what are some of the sporting events which Team Melbourne will have been involved with in Melbourne? Yeah, we, we ran it earlier this year, the um, Australian Games, which rotates from each team city mm -hmm. each year. We ran those earlier this year, and traditionally it's each year we run the swimming carnival, which happens as part of midsummer. Okay. So I look for that in the midsummer guide. Yeah, we okay. have set the date, but I can't remember it. Um, <laughs> so I look for that, which is always a hoot and, and very successful. And you normally come along too, which is great. I do. I love yeah. the swimming carnival because yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a sporting type of girl. I only wear stretch fabrics, as you know. <laughs> It sort of leads on to my next question, because to what capacity were you involved in Team Melbourne? Was that kind of an administrative level, or were you actually sort of out there playing the sports yourself? Um, it's a it was a voluntary thing, and I'm, I w I've still am. I'm the inaugural president of Team Melbourne. Can so you be two presidents? 
You can, but you don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> so Team Melbourne will hold its annual general meeting next week and uh, I will be stepping down from that position then. I've been there two years, okay. so it's probably time to move on and give someone else a go. Yeah. Okay. Were you very sporty at school? I was. <laughs> really? <laughs> Were yeah. you? What sports did you play? Um, I was a competitive swimmer <laughs> and I still swim, but not enough. Uh, and uh, I certainly enjoy it and I'm, I have a, have a liking for sport and for recreation activities okay. um, but don't seem to get to do enough of it as I would no, like to. Yeah. time. With a, uh, I, this is a fairly hairy question but it might be a little bit too academic. But this whole thing about, so I was wondering whether there's some kind of, whether you've actually sort of made any connection yourself between uh, you know, physical activity and sports and, and self-esteem levels. For, for lesbians and, and gay men. But, I mean, I know that mm -hmm. it's primarily a social, they're a social group as well, but yep. have you had any thoughts about that at all? I think that's probably one of the primary reasons behind the, the International Federation of Gay Games is to encourage participation in sport and recreation activities for the benefits of social interaction, um, helping gays and lesbians themselves to realise that, that, that you don't need to be a stereotype Sometimes even within our own communities we tend to stereotype ourselves as, well if you're a young gay man, you would, all you're interested in is going out to nightclubs and, and doing those sort of things, where in fact we're all different, we all have different interests and uh, sport is an interest of a lot of young gays and, and lesbians and even people who move on through their life cycles sure. um, can be involved in those activities and so that's what Team Melbourne's really there for, to encourage those sort of activities and the benefits. Yeah, it, it's a very, these events are very exciting and worth going to. So we should look out for the also foundation and associated events, in particular the dance parties, because if you go to the dance party you help to raise money which then goes for grants yep. for different organisations and we should also look out for Team Melbourne um, events. Adam, thank you so much for coming in. I have enjoyed our little chat. <laughs> Girl Talk. We're continuing our flow of lesbian health issues and again we're joined by Dr Ruth. How are you this Good evening? Good day. Now this is one that again we feel that we're a little bit exonerated from. It's not as easy to transmit STDs from one lesbian to another. Yeah well that's also a myth. Uh, there are a lot of STDs that can be transmitted between lesbians mm -hmm. uh, through normal lesbian sex and you know, I think it's important to, to know that firstly and also if you're worried about any symptoms that might be an STD to go and get it checked out and then talk with your partner about it. Because yeah. it is one of those things that the boys I think slotted into it quite well. Yeah. But um, I know myself, it's one of those things that was Penny Arcade once said in one of her shows, how on earth yeah. do you negotiate safe sex? Yeah, exactly. And you know, part of the problem is that uh, we've got the good old dental dam which is uh, has been the <laughs> standard well, safe sex item. Here. We have one right here. Have a look at this. Okay, I believe that's your Beautiful. camera. Look at this. Da doing, da doing, da doing. <laughs> Lots of stretching. <laughs> you can do absolutely anything <laughs> with that. Actually, great, I made they? a vest out of dental dance. Did you? That'd be lovely. But, um, very how, tactile. Very tactile. Yeah. How functional are they really? I mean, that looks as though it could break at any moment, really. Yeah, I mean, firstly, they're one use only, so that's important. Secondly, important to use some lube underneath on the skin surface uh -huh. so that it's uh, less likely to break. Right. Um, but also, the problem with dental dams is that it's only protecting us from certain external STDs like warts or herpes. Okay. And sure, there's a, a place, but it's not protecting us from any penetrating uh, STDs which exist, you know, chlamydia can be transferred between women, um, something called Gardnerella, which is a vaginal bug, even thrush. What does Gardnerella, I've never heard of that one. Yeah, that sounds like uh, something that really roses would get <laughs> yeah, rather than um, a human It's a bizarre brain. name. Sometimes mm. now it's called bacterial vaginosis, but it's a vaginal infection. Right. It's very easy to transfer to between women with any penetrative sex, so, right. and quite uh, unpleasant discharge and itch that you can get with it. 
And one of the things is too that now that women are using a lot more toys, I mean it seems to be that if you don't have a box yeah. of toys under your bed, we're not talking teddy bears and dolls. Exactly. That, um, you know, you're not yeah. part of the, the new age lesbian. Yeah. Would, would that be, I mean, the importance of two using um, condoms mm. and dams, yeah. um, yep. is, would there be a, a well, more of an insurgence of STDs between lesbians yeah. because of this? Probably that's right and we haven't done very much research at all on uh, transferring STDs between uh, women with toys or with uh, just digital contact so I'm sure that's uh, a major risk for yeah. lesbians. Because yeah. I think it's like, again if we get back to this sort of demystification of, of um, you know using yeah. condoms and things like that yeah. and um, no doubt you probably have people coming to you or women coming to you saying mm. well I kind of really don't want to use that. Yeah that's right and it's just encouraging people to be as safe as they can and mm -hmm. negotiating with their partner at the time and, and suggesting you know if there's any discharge or any lumps or anything that's suspicious you know go for using some protection uh, and maybe using protection with any new partner at least until you get to know them. Yeah, so. And of course it's that um, sort of like the negotiation thing. It, yeah. it, how's that being addressed like from your angle as a doctor? Yeah. No doubt you've been to forums and God knows what else about it all. That's right. It's very difficult. You know, the guys are finding that too, you know, that there's a lot less condom use uh, in certain areas of the community, in the gay mm -hmm. community. Uh, and likewise in the lesbian community, we're at a disadvantage because we haven't had the big publicity campaigns related to HIV and uh, so a lot of lesbians out there are saying we don't need to use anything and it's very much starting from the beginning with uh, people on a one-to-one -one basis. Yeah. One of the things I've found though, Dr. Ruth, is you go to a, a warehouse party or a special function put on by, you know, like the Also Foundation, yeah. for example, and Positive Women are there, and you always get a yeah. safe sex kit. Yeah. But I've never seen yeah. Dan's, like, in a chemist in a window or anything That's like right. that. That's yeah. right. They don't seem to be as accessible. Yeah, it's pity because it's, you know, they're hard to find. <clears throat> If you go into any normal chemist, they say, well, what's a dental dam? Or no, we don't stock those. So it's hard. We have to get a lot more uh, knowledge out there in the community and a lot more accessibility yeah, with condoms, gloves as well for digital sex. Because right. yeah. it is important. I mean, the, the thing is too that you know, I was really lucky that I have, I still have a box of gloves from an ex-relationship who was yeah. a nurse, yeah. which, you know, Handy. use them really just to wash the dishes more than anything else. <laughs> Dr. Ruth, thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Um, this, by the way, is a dental dam. We want you all to start using them with your toys and also, yeah. I mean, if we can be, yeah. you know, as well, clean your toys as well in the yeah. best way you know how. Yeah. Next time we're talking about artificial insemination, which Go is a very hot topic at the moment. So we will see you next time on Girl Talk, or otherwise known as Dark Chat at the moment, with Dr. Ruth. Thank you very much. something wrong with his immune system. David, given that this is one of the earlier films to sort of deal in a mainstream way with um, HIV and AIDS issues, tell me a little bit more about the story and, you know, how you felt about it. Well, I think it was, it was playing a broader educative role for both the gay community and the broader community because AIDS was a fairly unknown thing obviously in the mid 80s and even in 1990 there was still a lot of fear and ignorance around about it and I think while it's a fictionalised movie it, it did do that uh, task of educating the community about AIDS per se but it, it's essentially a story about a group of people that um, were confronted with a health crisis in their lives, many of them in their young, you know, in their early 20s and 30s, um, and how it affected the sort of social life that they had at Fire Island, you know, the parties and 
all that kind of uh, good time stuff when all of a sudden all these people around them were getting sick. And I, I think it's a fairly realistic portrayal of what the 80s were like for both uh, people in America and for that matter here in Australia. And it was at a time when they really didn't know what what the illness was. They had no... No, I, th I think probably in the early 80s they didn't hadn't even called it AIDS. It was called something else like gay men's immune syndrome or something. So there are some very strong performances in this movie and I particularly like the way the gay men physically relate to each other. How did you go with the performances? Yes, I thought it was fairly gay affirmative. I thought it showed... Um, uh, gay men um, being very supportive of each other and certainly uh, the scene where they look at uh, the first gay kiss on television because one of them writes soapy was was well done and sort of makes you realize how far we've come in the gay community to think that uh, broad popular television wouldn't have uh, seen a gay kiss in those days and now the big sponsors are actually chasing us well money. exactly yes yeah. so that, it's good to see those kind of roles. Well, I think it was, a, as you say, it was gay men relating as we do, and I thought the AIDS elements to it were fairly um, realistic, having lived through a lot of those experiences myself, being at the bedside of friends who've died. I thought the scene where uh, David and Sean, well, Sean's dying, and David's saying, you know, let go, let go. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly I've been through that myself and I think it's a fairly realistic portrayal and as you say, it shows some strong performances from the actors. How do you think have the issues changed or developed? Yeah, well, I mean, looking obviously at that recently, have. it's a real nostalgia trip because a lot of us have learnt a lot more about AIDS since then. I think really a lot of us have survived uh, HIV for a fairly long time and the message that movie was giving really was if you had HIV you were probably going to uh, develop AIDS in a short period of time. The way Sean developed the illness very quickly and then David, his lover, died a couple of years later, I mean a lot of people would have thought that was the scenario but in fact it hasn't been for a lot of people with HIV. We've survived. Mm -hmm. And I think that message of gloom and doom, uh, if a movie was to be made about AIDS for a popular audience now, I think it should address issues of survival and how people have coped with living with the virus. <laughs> Well, it's very exciting. Of course, we're here for the Night of Infectious Laughter. I believe this is the 10th um, event, and this year it's at the Melbourne Town Hall. People are actually coming up the stairs as we speak. So we thought we'd have a quick word. Hi there. Hi. Are you actually associated with the Infectious Laughter team? Yeah, You've got your little... Oh, you're cast. Yes, I'm cast. So you're the, one of the instrumentalists. Oh, okay. This is actually the logo this year. It's a little red doggy. Now, uh, 100%... World AIDS at 1st of December, 100% aware. Now, you're actually selling ribbons and things. I am. And this is a new slogan for the year, Force for Change. Oh, can we have a quick look at that? That's lovely. They're, and they're $5. $5 and the usual red ribbon for two. So these will actually be on sale before the Saturday. World AIDS... Saturday, Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Is yeah. this the first time you've ever been? No, I come every year to do get you? Indeed. And what, what do we expect to see tonight? Oh, lots of fabulous people being terribly funny, I think. You've got your little ribbon there. Got the ribbon? Yes. <laughs> so came last year. Came last year. And the thing, of course, we want to say about you might have a drawer full of the red ribbons, but it's still important to buy them because they are obviously, you know, every year it's kind of like a donation type thing. Absolutely. Just like the red poppy, the same thing. You buy one every year. Yeah, I think we're being called the Night of Infectious Laughter Orchestra. All <laughs> right. It's renamed you for the gig. renamed us for the gig, so. Well, I hope you get all the notes in the right place. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My girlfriend got something to do with it and I'm here with her. Did she drag you along? Yes, she did. And what does she do? Is she a volunteer with her? No, she's a publicist. Okay, is she from Brown Nose? Yes. Is it Ali? Yes. I know Ali. You actually come along to the Night of Infectious Laughter. That's right. Have you been to this event before? Yes. A regular? Last couple of years, yeah. Now, what can we expect at this gig? Lots of laughter. That's right. This is very upmarket for the Night of Infectious Laughter. Nothing very beats a little bit of red carpet. We like a bit of red. A bit of red velvet. It's a nice thing. Thanks. I love the colour of your hair. Oh, thank you. Nice. <laughs> I goes. hope you have a good evening. Yeah, no. Right. So I thought, so you kind of matched the surprise. It's, 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 it's good, isn't it? It's very, very aware. <laughs> thank you. <Yes. laughs> 
the usual kind of suspects, uh, I think Sue M. Post, um, Linda Gibson, Rachel Berger, she's fantastic, she's emceeing, she's emceed, she emceed seven consecutive infectious laughters, I think this is her eighth, she took two years off because it all got too much for her, um, but she's been fantastic for uh, raising the profile of HIV AIDS awareness in Victoria since, you know, 1980, whatever. Now you've got your little ribbon there as well, that's very smart, see, now this is, we want to see this ribbon on everybody's chest for the next couple of weeks. I've got about 2,000 of them, so I'll just keep collecting. Maybe I could sew them all together and make a coat. <laughs> <laughs>